we touched on in the beginning of this, you know, being on the trail, the trail is my teacher. So what I call, I call it dirt Dharma. So it's like, it's like, I learn who I am out there and, and I want, I feel better when I'm active. I'm a better version of myself when, when I have a challenge that's coming up or I'm regularly exercising and training. And so the why for me is that, that this is who I am. Welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast, where a professional triathlete and an age grouper talk all things sport and life. We are here to educate and enlighten, but most importantly, to keep it real. We are your hosts, Amy Woods and Angela Nate. Let's race to it. Hey, everyone. We are so excited to share our conversation with pro athlete Rebecca Rush. Rebecca is a seven-time world champion, mountain bike and gravel cycling hall of famer, an author, an Emmy award winner for her documentary Blood Road, and founder of the Be Good Foundation. Her nickname is the Queen of Pain because she has the ability to push through mental and physical barriers and come out stronger on the other side. Rebecca is more than an athlete, however. She is an explorer and an adventurer. But what we most admire about Rebecca is her support of female athletes all over the world and her determination to change the cycling community to be more inclusive and more accessible one bike ride at a time. We know you will enjoy this conversation. We sure did. We are excited to have a new sponsor for the podcast. This episode is sponsored by thefeed.com. The Feed is the largest online marketplace for your sports nutrition, and uh, both Angela and I use it. So Angela, what do you love the most about the feed? Well, the best part of the feed is you can sample all different types of products and gear. And if you enjoy it, you can get a whole packet um, of gels, say of like 20, if you really like it for really, really cheap comparatively. Or if you want to try different products, you can just get one-offs. Um, it's just a fantastic way to trial and error. Mm -hmm. Basically everything that you want for new for your nutrition. I really like, I feel like it's curated for athletes. So they pick and choose what they want to put an offer on their site and they have really amazing products. And I do like that you can just buy one gel and see if you like it and then buy more. And we are so lucky to offer you guys a discount code, 25% off almost all feed products using the code RACEGIRL. That's the feed.com. Use the code race girl and go check it out because we use it. I mean, we get packages. I get packages almost every week from the feed. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we go a little overboard, but there's so much on there. It's not just nutrition. There's um, massagers. There's high price products. There's, um, I mean, clothing and gear, a variety of different clothing and gear. I actually just tried a couple bars that I've never even heard of before, and they're fantastic because myself I'm not much of a cook so I like to have things on the go and throw a bunch of fuel in my car so that anytime I, I need a snack I always have healthy snacks and you know the bars are fantastic if you can get some good ones so it's really opened up my eyes to a variety yeah it's just a one-stop shop for athletes mm -hmm. so once again 25% off almost all feed products by using the code race girl at the feed.com Hey everyone, and welcome back to the I Race Like a Girl podcast. We have a super special guest on today. We have the legendary uh, Rebecca Rush with us. Uh, and usually, Rebecca, we like to list, you know, accomplishments of our guests before we dive in, but we don't have like an hour to list your accomplishments. So I'm just going to get, so I'm going to just do a few of them. Um, for those of you who don't know Rebecca, and there are, maybe there are some people out there I don't know. Rebecca is a seven time world champion in multiple events. She is in the mountain bike and graveling and gravel cycling hall of fame. She has won unbound 200 mile or multiple times and 350 XL. Um, I think twice, uh, she's a four time Leadville 100 champion. Um, you summited Mount Kilimanjaro by bike. Uh, you're, and, um, you're an accomplished adventure racer. You also won an Emmy, um, for your film blood road, uh, which we have both seen. 
Um, and that, if you don't know that film, um, Rebecca cycled the length of the Ho Chi Minh Trail in search of her father's plane, um, which I think hopefully we'll talk about. Um, her father was shot down in the Vietnam War. Um, and although, Rebecca, your physical accomplishments are many, you also um, have spent many years giving back to um, your community and supporting athletes all over the world. The list could go on, but welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast. <laughs> Yay, thank you. And I've been having fun um, listening to your most recent episodes and, and your escapades um, lately. <laughs> did and did you listen to gravel. Unbound? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. And loving that you're both getting into gravel and Angela and I have a long history together. So it's cool to connect again. Yeah, actually, I wanted to start with that. So I met you at Red Bull. We've done a few camps there. We did a bunch of testing. I remember one one time we went from below sea level all the way up to 10,000 feet and did, you know, all out efforts. And that was just nuts, <laughs> but super fun. And then another time we did that fear camp where we, we it was all about facing fears and I wasn't much of a mountain biker and we had a day where we got to mountain bike and stuff. And I chose to do that because I knew you were going to be there and do that. And I just remember that day so well because you basically sat behind me most of the time and just said, you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> Cause I was so not used to being on a mountain bike. And, um, yeah, since then I I've just been looking more and more at your achievements. And now that I'm jumping into Leadville and I mean, I, I personally want to pick your brain. Hopefully we get some time <laughs> on this podcast, but really excited to have you on and see you again. And I know you have Rebecca's private Idaho, which you, um, have encouraged me to come for the last couple of years. So I'm hoping to come in the next year or two. Um, and yeah, so we'll start there. Yeah. Go ahead. Awesome. Uh, do you remember riding with Angela? That She's I, like, she's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there is the, the triathlete. I mean, she's a triathlete. If I, you yeah. know, if I, she'd put me in aero bars and, or made me run or swim, you know, it would have been the same thing. And I think that's what was really cool about those Red Bull athlete performance camps is, you know, we got a bunch of high achievers together in different sports and, but you still see the same tenacity, the same, even if it, you know, mountain biking wasn't your thing. Um, mm -hmm. It was so cool to learn from other people, just kind of um, the grit and determination, regardless of what sport you're in. And so, yeah, I mean, it was, it's actually kind of fun to see a super high, you know, highly accomplished athlete, a little bit out of their comfort zone and okay with it, which, you know, a lot of people, Angela, wouldn't, wouldn't jump into something that they were going to suck at, you know, right away. Yeah. You'd be yeah. Like, Oh, I'm not going to do it. So it was super brave. And luckily I didn't have to go swimming with you because I would not. <laughs> that, that, that was one thing about the camp was the grit. You know, we had all the psychologists come on board and, and do all these tests with us and, they really tr tried to measure and qualitate grit. And that was, that was really interesting to me. And working with all the different athletes, as you said, you know, we had, we had skiers, we had divers, snowboarders, yourself, you know, riders. It was just, it was, I look back on those, on those camps and they changed my life. I mean, uh, it was such a great experience. I mean, amazing. amazing. Well, so, so how, how do you measure grit? I mean, Rebecca, I've read your book. I've seen um, your, you know, uh, Blood Road. I read a lot, you know, I've read up a lot about you. I've admired you. And when you think about Rebecca Rush, you think about grit. Um, <laughs> and so where, where does that come from? You know, I think I've thought a lot about this and I think some of the behavior you're born with, you know, there's just some people that, you know, just come out kind of hardcore. Um, but I also think it's a learned behavior. So it's not to say, you know, if you feel that you're not gritty, that you can't develop it because what I've learned and, and what we learned through sports is you put yourself in a hard situation voluntarily by doing sport over and over again. And suddenly it's like, okay, I've been here before. I learned how to change a flat. I fall off my bike. I learned how to get up you know? Um, and so by voluntarily doing hard things, we can learn grit. And especially when it doesn't go well, you know, like pushing your bike through the mud or whatever, then the next time you do that, it's like, okay, I know how to do this. And so, you know, it's why sport is so fantastic because we don't really get a practice 
run for life. We don't really, we're all going to be faced with really hard situations in our life with the death of a spouse or whatever. Um, and we don't get to practice that, but in sport, we do get to practice that. And it's why I'm always encouraging people to be lifelong athletes, to do different sports. You know, even if, you know, you've been a triathlete forever, Angela, but you're like, Mm -hmm diving into some other things because Mm -hmm. you're, you're learning, you know, to be a beginner, to be bad at something, to crash, to burn and to get back up and do it again. And so I do think some people are given extra healthy dose maybe when they're born, (laughs) but I also think athletes really develop it and they show there's studies that show, you know, girls or people who are athletes as young kids or in high school, more of them become CEOs, more of them, you know, develop the tools to really succeed in life, not just in its sport. And so everyone's like, oh, I'm not a pro. I'm not an athlete. I'm not this or that. It's like, yes, sign up for a race, sign up for something that's mm-hmm. hard because who cares what place you get? You're actually going to develop life skills that are so essential for us. Yeah. And I think one thing that people might not know about you, which I was surprised, is that you actually really didn't start riding a bike or riding for real until you were, what, 38? Yeah. So talking oh, about... Really? I didn't know that. So, which is <laughs> incredible. <laughs> and I love it because especially for women, there's this whole like, well, I don't know how to do that. Like, I'm too old for that. You know, I why should I, you know, I didn't do my first triathlon until 40. And I mean, I was a runner, but then I was just like all in and the whole, and, and so when you, can you talk about what it was like when you, like why you started to go from, you were an adventure, you were a, um, like a rock climber, a boulder, and then you went to adventure racing and then how you transitioned into cycling. And like, can you recall those early days of cycling (laughs) and how, tell us about that. Yeah, for sure. So I've been, I started as a runner in high school, um, in college. So I ran track and cross country. Then I started rock climbing. Then I did a bunch of paddling. Um, then I did a bunch of adventure racing and, and you know, the most recent iteration is cycling. So yeah, a runner to start with, and it may seem sort of circuitous and not related, but really the common theme through all of those sports are adventure. You know, I love to adventure as a little kid, Mm -hmm. I would camp in the backyard before I found organized sports. And so the theme is the same. It's just taken a little bit of a different, you know, oh, that looks fun. That looks interesting. Cycling was a really interesting trajectory because it was absolutely my worst sport. I hated it. I, it was part of adventure racing. So you kind of had to do it um, a little bit and I really didn't like it. Um, and it was sort of kind of a Phoenix from the ashes sort of a thing. Um, you know, adventure racing, you know, I had a friend die right in front of us one year, um, lost all our sponsorship. I was team captain. I'd been doing it for 10 years and it's like within the, you know, course of a month, you know, my motivation, sponsorship, everything dried up and it was like, okay, well now I have to go get a real job. (laughs) And this was November. (laughs) It was November of that year. And basically a bunch of girlfriends from Idaho here where I live we're like, let's just go do 24 hours of Moab. Let's just go have some fun and go <laughs> camping. And, you know, the people who asked me are, you know, elite ski racers and like all these, you know, kind of uber fit athletes. And we're like, let's just go camping. It'll be fun. And I was like, okay, you know, and we went and did that race. My husband, he wasn't my husband then, but like this guy I was interested in, he had been doing 24 hour races. So he's like, I'll crew for you. And so we went as a am or a, I think it was like an amateur team. We weren't, none of us were pro anything. So we went as an amateur team um, and we, we won our division and I ended up having the fastest lap times of any female on the course, <laughs> but I was running my bike down all the technical stuff. I, <laughs> so I was like running, getting on my bike going, but I was just like, I think I just needed to burn off some energy and it was with all my friends and it, it didn't matter. And it was like those girlfriends, you know, getting me together saying, let's just go ride bikes. And then it was like, okay. So then my husband now he had done some 24 hour solo racing. He's like, you know what? I think you should do a 24 hour solo. And I'm like, okay. So <laughs> he crewed for me. I went and did one and I won um, the whole field overall and beat all the men. And again, I was not a good technical rider, but I could stay up all night. 
Like I was like, one day that's no big deal because adventure races were like seven and 10 days long. Mm, right, so I'm like right. one night, that's short. Like, so for me, 24 <laughs> hours was really short. And I'm like, no big deal. I'll be sleeping tomorrow night. And yeah. so that first race, yeah, I beat everyone. And then my second 24 hour race was nationals and I won that. And so that just started this trajectory. Um, and I, the first article that was written about me as a mountain biker was called winning ugly. And it's because <laughs> I was such a bad technical rider, but I had the grit to be like, I'm, I'll just mm-hmm. run everything. I don't care, you know? And so that was my foray into cycling and, and yeah, I was a terrible cyclist. And so, but I could go long. And so I kind of used my strengths and eventually learned and eventually got better and, and now cycling is, is really kind of my mainstay for adventuring and exploring. So you're saying there's a chance for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did my first mountain bike race at Sea Otter. Cool. I'm part of the Grand Prix ra- yeah. pre thing. And yeah. I don't know much about mountain bike. And I crashed like three times. I think I fractured my sacrum actually. Oh. And it was brutal. Um, but it healed after a month or whatever. But... I mean, I'm much better on um, a gravel bike that has aero bars because I, I'm just so, so used to it. But it's yeah. definitely technique oriented in terms of the mountain biking skills. So I think there's another one on the circuit. Well, and also Leadville, but Leadville. yeah, it's a, so I'll it's give a you a practice stuff. tip that works really great for mountain bike skills. And this was something that I did. I found in those 24 hour races, I would ride better technically like you do a loop course and so I pre-ride the course and I'm I'm like crying I'm like I can't ride this what am I doing (laughs) but then during the middle of the night when I've just got my headlamp and I'm I'm 12 hours in I'm totally fatigued I would be able to ride the technical stuff because my head got out of the way you know and so a good way to practice it that I would do is find a little hill that you can do for intervals and I'd go like up on a fire road and then down the rest, the rest part was down a little section of single track huh. and then do the hill interval. So I'm tired and then come down the single track. And that was teaching me when I'm tired to actually kind of let go. And it was like, my brain got out of the way instead of saying, huh. I can't, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. Yeah. It's like, you're tired enough in your intervals that you're just like, okay, you know, um, or, or do a 24 hour race and see what happens over <laughs> Yeah, actually, I found when I did um, Unbound last year, that was my first gravel race. And then this year, the longer the race went, I just didn't care. Like, I I just went and I just held my bike. I'm like, you know what? I don't care. And it was great. It was fantastic because you honestly, again, you like the mind just goes away and you're just in the moment, which is absolutely the best feeling in the world is when you're at that moment anyway. So it's a good lesson that our brain can can often get in the way and make us more tense and more nervous. Mm -hmm. And then we ride poorly. So yeah. yeah, you just need to get, you just need to do super long races. I'll tell you, at Leadville, you'll be plenty tired on the downhills. So. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. <laughs> or maybe, you know, what you need to do is tonight at 10 p.m. when the, after the oh, sun God. sets, you got to go out with a headlamp on the trails. One thing, just to, t- just to touch on that, how, how the hell, how do you stay up for 24 hours? Because I, I mean, that just seems insane to me. Well, like, did you ever pull you an all-nighter in college? Didn't you ever do that? Yeah, and I was annihilated. <laughs> and riding a bike <laughs> but yeah I mean actually at the Red Bull camp we pulled an all-nighter one night and that was that was rough <laughs> I mean it's kind of mindset it's like if somebody said you were going to do a 100 mile race and then you get to 100 miles and and this happens in Leadville and it's it's actually 103 miles it's not 100 miles and so you get you finish your 100 and you're just like no way I couldn't possibly do another three miles like what the hell um, yeah. So it's your mindset. If you were going into a 12 hour race and all of a sudden it turned into a 24 hour race, it would be different. But if you yeah. go in knowing I'm going to ride all night, um, then you're just ready for it. And, and I, I kind of with really long stuff and, you know, maybe you're finding this is I break it into segments. It's like, mm. you know, six hour segments, you know, from now until sunset. And then, okay, I'm just going to get till midnight. Okay. And then the sunrise is going to come at 6 a.m. And so breaking it into segments like that makes it seem a little less daunting than, you know, oh my gosh, I've got to ride 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, the same with like a 1200 mile ride in the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It's like, okay, I'm going to break it into segments and I know I'm in this for the long haul. So you race differently when you, when you know you're doing a long distance. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And so I I just want to go back. You mentioned um, where you were talking about um, the mountain biking and you talked about how like you were crying and scared. And one of the things that really stood out to me in your book was how, you know, and we talked about grit, how I think people think like uh, you and Angela and people who do crazy stuff that you're just all grit and you're all brave and courageous, but you talk a lot about fear. And I love the parts where you're like admitting that you're crying and that you are scared to do something. Um, because we all have that, whether it's in sport or life, um, me staring down the swim in a triathlon, (laughs) but, um, so can you just talk a little bit about how you personally overcome that fear and maybe it depends on each situation or how you have learned to overcome the fear. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll just reiterate that we're, we're all human. We have human emotions, you know, whether you're pro or not, um, we're all pretty similar in that we have insecurities, we have fears, we have good days, we have bad days, we have days that are hard to train and we don't want to do it. You know, so we are all human and we kind of share the human experience. Um, And then, you know, I'll also say the word fear, you know, it's this four letter word that kind of gets a bad rap that um, people are like, I need to conquer fear. I need to not have any fear. And fear is fear is excitement. Fear is really the same emotion of of adrenaline and excitement. And um, so what I do with fear is I try to break it down. It's like, okay, what am I afraid of? I'm Mm -hmm. maybe it's a technical section. I'm afraid of crashing my bike. Then it's like, okay, well, what can I do about that? I can run down this section and just avoid it. Or I can follow, you know, somebody that I trust, follow their line. I can learn it, you know? So it's kind of evaluating why you're feeling that and what's the worst outcome. So if it's like, I'm afraid to go down this mountain bike section, worst outcome, I might crash and, you know, ruin my race. Like, okay, then I'll just run down it. No big deal. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'll come back and practice it later and break it down. So, you know, fear doesn't go away. Um, it's just, it's an excited state. And so I also try to shift the dialogue in my mind. You know, what we say to ourselves can be really diabolical and awful and terrible. Things that we would never say to another human. Like, you suck. Why should you be here? You should get another job. (laughs) What are you doing? We would never say that to another human. And so flipping it, if I'm on a start line, you know, I'm feeling really anxious and nervous. And is that fear or is it anxious and excited? It's it's probably anxious and excited. And then maybe there's fear of, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who's going to win, but who cares? Like you just go out and, and do your best. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I remember my fourth Leadville, my husband, like he thought there was something wrong with me because I wasn't nervous on the start line. Because usually <laughs> I'm just all like, nerves are about the unknown. That's yeah. where fear comes from. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how we're going to handle it. We don't know what to do. And that fourth Leadville, I was like, I know this course. I know the time I can put down on it. If someone's faster than me, then they're faster than me. If I get a flat tire, I'm going to fix it. If I crash, I'm going to get up. So I wasn't nervous that fourth Leadville. And I I won that year too. But my husband was like, I was worried about you at the beginning because you weren't (laughs) freaking out. Um, but, But fear goes away with experience. And so that's, again, why people should sign up for things they haven't done. Go do something different. It's why I've changed sports so many times is because I'm curious about like, what would it be to ride my bike up and down Kilimanjaro? Yeah. <laughs> and I was really nervous about the elevation and all that. And so I prepared for it. I went and I slept in an altitude tent. I did all this cool, like, testing um, with my coach and, like, riding in this altitude chamber. And so I prepared. And that took away the factors that I could control. I call it controlling the controllables because yep. something's going to happen unexpected on the course. But if you, you know, prepared, you've trained, you've got the right mindset, you've planned the route, you've studied it a little bit, then that takes away a lot of the fear of like, okay, you know, even if you're going somewhere unknown, you've controlled what you can. So there's kind of assurance. Even, you know, when I go ride in Alaska, I'm, I'm really afraid of the cold and, you know, riding there is you're riding self-supported, you know, for a week in minus 40 degree temperatures. 
And the first year I went, I was talking to my friend, Jay Peter, who's a mentor. He's like, well, you're going to, what are you afraid of? I said, I'm afraid of freezing. I'm afraid of getting lost. And I'm afraid of running out of batteries for my lights and being alone in the dark. And he's like, okay. And he said, well, then carry your fears. And so I carried a lot of extra clothes. I carried multiple maps and I carried way too many batteries. And that was fine. Then the next year, I didn't carry quite so much, so many fears. Um, But if you break down what are you afraid of and you accommodate for that, um, then you're not getting rid of fear. You're just actually meeting it. I like Um, carry your fears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms of that, do you ever feel like you ever paralyzed yourself with over analysis? Like in like when I did a lot of races, um, like just for triathlon and stuff, when I first started, I was very, very fearful, exact same things you had planned out everything. But then over the years, you know, I just, I kind of let all that go. And maybe it's because I've experienced the racing part, but in terms of like looking over the courses and, and analyzing all these certain things that could go wrong, I just was like, well, this is racing, you know, like, like I had confidence in what I could do, no matter what the course, what outside factors there were. And I guess that is controlling the controllables, but what you do in terms of the adventure racing and, and like these, these like epic adventures, you do have to process and like look at all these different things. But do you ever find yourself like it's too much? Because for me and Amy, for example, Amy's one that would go to a race and like no mile by mile by mile marker. And then I, I'm just like, I'm just going to do my best and I'm going to see what I got, you know, and I, I don't overanalyze things. Yeah, but you're also a more experienced athlete than Amy is. Mm. You've done it a lot more, and so you you have that confidence in yourself. You're like, I've been I've been here before. I can get through mm. a triathlon. I know I can. And so you don't need to analyze. So yeah, at a point you start to grow, and then you're kind of like, mm-hmm. I got this. I know what stuff I need to bring. I'll just go to the start line. I know how to train. And so you've developed that confidence, so you don't have to be hyper analytical. You know, my first year of Leadville, I studied the map because I didn't get a chance to pre-ride. And then after after that first year, and I taped it to my top tube, and I had these little things all written down, but I, then I didn't need to do that the second time around. And, you mm-hmm. know, I'm guessing that Amy right now is, is really hyper-preparing to give herself confidence because she doesn't yet know what she can do as an athlete and she's learning that and so yeah Yeah. everyone's in different stages and yeah we can spend time obsessing and then at some point you just say screw it I'm just going and that's where I ask myself (laughs) there's definitely been lots of races where I've wanted to do more preparation I wanted to do more training and I just didn't get to it and you just that's the point where you say okay what's the worst thing that happened I don't finish okay great Mm -hmm. I'm still gonna do it anyway You know, and so, yeah, there is a point, Angela, where you're just like, you can overanalyze. So it's confidence in the beginning. And then after a while, you're just like, well, I'm just going to go. What's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. Have you found that when you've had that, that progression that you've had a lot better race experiences? Um, Like when I did um, Ironman World Champs, I I didn't really, I was just so grateful to be there because I went through all this like illness and injury and stuff. And I didn't have necessarily the preparation in terms of the course or anything. I just was grateful to have the experience and I had the best race of my life. Yeah. You had things like that because I know it's a little different because I mean, you do these two week adventure things that are just like, they do need preparing, but I'm just curious. Yeah. And you know, our, why, why we show up for events shifts and changes Mm. throughout our lives. You know, when I was racing Leadville and Unbound and all that was like, I was going to win, you know, and I really wanted to win and and the preparation is different. Um, Some of these, you know, my sort of more recent trajectory with all these winter bike expeditions, I wanted to go back to being scared again and being kind of a newbie again, because I wanted to challenge myself. Like, can I, in my fifties do something that I thought was impossible, which is winter bike expeditions. And so I went into that and, and, the fear of the elements were enough to make me be like, I have to train for this. I have to, cause you're right. I kind of got used to like, Oh, I know I can ride a hundred miles. I can do this. I can do that. I can go on this adventure, but I actually wanted another challenge that would kind of make me prepare like that again. And I wanted to see, 
Um, but yeah, some races you're just like, I'm just so happy to be here. Like, I'm so happy to be riding my bike. Like sometimes that's your why, you know, my why with the winter expeditions is to really push myself and see if I can. My why for, you know, if other stuff is different. You know, if I'm riding with a friend or my why for I ride RPI, my event, it's to actually help other people. And so it's different every time. And so, yeah, when you went back after your illnesses, you're just like, man, I'm so happy to be riding my bike. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I guess, you know, that's the thing to think about for people who are hopefully lifelong athletes is why are you there? And it's different all the time. But if you don't know why you're there, then it's, it's hard to one, forgive yourself if you haven't prepared all the way like a pro or whatever, or it's also hard to, um, be grateful if you don't know why you're there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You touched a little bit on your age and I just, um, I mean, I just turned 40 this year and I thought I, I like at first, like 10 years ago, I thought that was pretty old, but now I'm like, no way. Like I have so many more years ahead of me and, and athletes like you in your fifties, like pushing the limits. Um, we have a gal, she is a professional triathlete still in the circuit. I think she's 52 this year, 51. And it's just phenomenal to see, to see that and experience that. And, and do you have a reason why for that? Because of like, as you get older, I mean, obviously your wise change, but you're pushing boundaries that probably haven't been pushed before or that we know of anyways, in terms of your age and in terms of what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, people ask me all the time, you know, when are you going to retire? And, and really never. the answer is <laughs> never. And the reason why is that, that like we touched on in the beginning of this, you know, being on the trail, the trail is my teacher. So what I call, I call it dirt Dharma. So it's yeah, like, I it. it's like, I learn who I am out there and, and I want, I feel better when I'm active. I'm a better version of myself when, when mm -hmm. I have a challenge that's coming up or I'm regularly exercising and training. And so the why for me is that, that this is who I am, you know, I'm not a cycle. Cycling is what I do, but it's also a vehicle of like who I am and how I want to be a human. And so, yeah, my why for, for pushing like that is that I'm still a human experiment of one, you know, and of one, um, to learn about myself and to continue to get stronger physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, like that all happens out when I'm mm -hmm. in motion outside. Yeah, I've always said um, when I'm racing, it's it's the one time that I have my physical, mental, mental, spiritual, and emotional side all connected. Yeah. And that's my why is because that's when I feel me. Like it's the only time I ever feel fully alive, and and I strive for that every day. Is that is that connection? So I can totally. Well, in our it's <laughs> awesome, and you know, so many people are finding that in sport that like. Mm -hmm. Our body is a way to access our insides, you know, our mm -hmm. physical body that we move around in this world with is, is not just a physical body, but it, but using it, f your physical body is really a way to access who you are on the inside. And yogis have known this forever, but I love cyclists are figuring it out. Runners are <laughs> figuring out, you know, runners high or whatever you call it. It's that connection to yourself and everything around you by moving. Well, and I think for me, I mean, I was a runner. I was, you know, kind of a gym rat. I was never a huge athlete growing up. But when I finished that first triathlon, I, I said this, I think, in when you interviewed me, like that second podcast, like mm -hmm. triathlon, it changed my identity. Like it changed how I looked at myself. It changed how I looked at my body. It changed yeah. how I just, I felt like a badass, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I, I relearned how to swim for triathlon and it, you know, if I could get like every female to do a yeah. triathlon, like, you yeah. know, it's probably the way you think. And this is why you have your event. And, you know, maybe, um, you know, we could talk about you just do a lot with the community and other women. Like, I just feel like if we can just, it just changes how you look at yourself, sport mm -hmm. and being active. Um, and I just, you know, it, it fundamentally changed how I looked at myself and what I could, what I could do. It's so true. And I experienced that for the first time in high school with the cross country running team. You know, I was had an eating disorder. I didn't like myself, you know, super low confidence. 
and I started running and connected with the community. And all of a sudden, my body was a tool to do cool stuff. And I wanted to take care of it because it could run. And, you know, I keep over and over, you know, many, many decades later, like you said, I feel better when I'm moving and I feel confident and I feel good about myself and I have a community of friends. And so you're absolutely right that sport heals and it's why I put on an event. It's why, you know, you do this podcast is to try to share that magic. If everybody mm-hmm. ran and ride a, rode a bike, everybody in the whole world, <laughs> we would have a lot different, a lot of different issues, less issues to be talking yeah. about in the world. Mm-hmm. Especially for mental health, for physical health, for so many things. Mm -hmm. I know. And so, um, you know, I kind of just want to ask you, because as a female endurance athlete, um, you know, I read your book. And of course, we know the mountain bike community is very much male. The endurance, um, the adventure racing community that you were in for a long time uh, is very much male. Um, And so what has it been like to navigate those worlds as a female endurance athlete and how do you think that actually has changed since your kind of earlier days of racing do you think it has changed yeah it changed so much there's so many women mountain biking running climbing kayaking doing everything like absolutely you know um it has changed a lot and it's pretty exciting and maybe you know at the races there's often you know a skewed number but it's not skewed in participation when you look around at the trailhead and and people taking part. I think there's a little bit of a fear factor for women and girls wanting to get involved in events um, or races as a four letter word, because um, we, we want to compete with ourselves. We don't often want to like have a bunch of people around us watching us or so, (laughs) but in participation, yeah, women are out there and it's super Mm -hmm. exciting to see in every sport. So it's changed a lot. Um, in, I will say, um, yeah, in the early days, it's, it's, it's a little hard to be outnumbered. Um, but there was a small group and community of women that, that, you know, we banded together and, and I was sort of, um, you know, stubborn about it that like, well, I'm going to show them, I can mm-hmm. I'm gonna show them, especially in ultra endurance, that the difference between men and women's performance, um, is becomes closer and closer and equalized eventually. And in those, those seven day long adventure races, the first three days I'd be hanging off the back and then the, the tides would turn and the last half I would be stronger than the guys. And so, I kept seeing that and believing it, seeing it for myself and just felt like I need to be here so that other people can see what women can do, you know, and in those adventure racing days, we finished fourth in, you know, one of the biggest races in the world in eco challenge with a three woman, one man team. And we were right up there with the leaders and people couldn't believe it. I'm like, (laughs) I believe it. And so it was, it's been really great to just show people um, instead of raise my voice and yell and scream, it's like, well, I'll just show you. And, yeah. you know, mass starts <laughs> events like Leadville were pretty exciting. I mean, I finished 20th one year mm-hmm. in Leadville and people can then see like, oh, you're pretty good. You know, <laughs> not pretty good for a girl, not pretty good for anything, but you're a good athlete. And so I'm really proud that I've been able to sort of trailblaze for other people, um, but yeah, it's changing, not quite fast enough, but um, it's absolutely changing. And this podcast <laughs> is is really helping that. <laughs> we hope so. We hope so. Um, absolutely. So I kind of want to shift gears because we watched Blood Road and that was really, really moving. And I just right. want to give a little bit of a background for people. First of all, you can find, um, I know you can find the documentary on Red Bull. Um, your father was killed in action in the Vietnam War um, when his plane was shot down near the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You were three years old. And in 2016, you decided to bike the Ho Chi Minh Trail and find where his plane went down. Um, and I, I was watching it. And, you know, the whole journey, you could just see like the weight on your shoulders and the, the gravity of the situation. Just so much was on your mind. Um, as you were getting closer and closer. Mm -hmm. And then um, one of the moments, you know, you wanted to get there on the day he was shot down and you came close and then you had to wait to get permission to see the site. And I, you know, I'm I'm just watching this like, oh my (laughs) gosh. But um, 
you know, and then you found the site and you found that tree and it was such a powerful moment. And then after you, there was just this sense of, I don't want to say peace, but this, uh, uh, just something a little lighter about you and for the rest of the journey, um, as you continued on. And, um, um, I just would like to know in your words, like what were your takeaways from that journey and how did that fundamentally kind of change you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a it was a big the most important ride in my life. And there were a lot of takeaways. And and absolutely when I went, my dad was shot down when I was three. I don't remember him. I didn't have a connection to like my parent. And I didn't really realize until I got there that like a part of me was missing, that I wasn't connected to. And and at that tree in that place, I felt him and I, I felt like complete. And, you know, for anyone who's lost someone, we, I think we realize that those people are with us. They're in our mm -hmm. DNA. They're with us, even if they're not physically there. And so I learned that for the first time that my dad is always a part of me. He's, he's always there. I just hadn't been listening. And so I felt this real connection to like the other half of me, mm -hmm. you know, and my mom is one way and I'd always heard my dad is one way. And and it was kind of like this puzzle piece being put back for me personally. So that was super rewarding. And it was reinforcement that, yes, the bike riding expeditions I'm doing, like, like you're on the right path. I definitely felt his love and energy and, and a com like I said, a puzzle piece was put back into place of like, I'm doing the right thing. And then I also felt really strongly what I learned um, is the is how the, the bike connects, you know, Huen and I, my, my Vietnamese teammate, we're on opposite sides of a conflict, you know, mm -hmm. and her father served in the war. My father served in the war and we didn't even speak the same language, but the connection that we built with no words, just by riding a bicycle, it, it kind of showed me that, that people can heal and people can come together regardless of whatever, you know, hideous past there is. And Huen said those words. I didn't know a lot of what she was saying because she her English was broken and not that great. And I don't speak Vietnamese <laughs> until I saw the film and I saw the subtitles and I saw that we understood each other without even knowing that. And it just gave me hope for humanity and that people can come together no matter how different you are. And then the third thing that I really took away from that is that I needed to use my bike for more. And, you know, my dad signed his letters home with the words, be good. And when I learned about all the unexploded bombs that are still there from the Vietnam War, it ended 50 years ago. And, it, you know, in Laos, people are still dying from unexploded ordnance that we dropped. And I felt really strongly his message was like he was remorseful and that he wanted me to do something about it. And so the Be Good Foundation was launched in his name. And one of our main projects is clearing bombs along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. And, and it's, it's an amazing project. And, you know, we do a lot of other bike related stuff. The mission statement is you, for the Be Good Foundation is using the bicycle as a catalyst for healing, empowerment and evolution. And so we do a lot of different projects, but I chose those words because that's what the bike does for me. Um, it's what it does for a lot of communities. And so like the ride on Kilimanjaro was for World Bicycle Relief to help people in Africa have bikes to, you know, go to school and get water and go to market. And so there's a lot of cool projects, but that was the really big takeaway there was like him saying, yeah, your career has been amazing and here you can do more with it. And so the Be Good Foundation and every ride I do now has some sort of a Be Good aspect to it. And, and it's awesome because it feels great to give back to a sport that has given to me. Yeah. I mean, um, I saw, first of all, if you don't, you can find, um, Be Good on, um, Rebecca's website, which we will link to and we'll put it in the show notes. Um, yeah, was, that was actually my next question to ask about Be Good because he signed his letters off that and um, and that's just fantastic. And so when you got home from that trip, you know, did you approach your next adventures? I want to say adventures because even though you're doing races, um, you're just like this 
explorer. You just go off and do these awesome things. You know, did you approach your next things differently or did you come right back into, cause I don't have my timeline in front of me. Did you go right back into, you know, racing and things like that? Or did you kind of take a moment and shift? I had to shift cause I realized I had changed and I came home and went to some races and things and it felt a little empty. And so I spent probably a couple years of like, okay, I just did the most important ride of my life. What now? Like, mm. what am I supposed to do with this? And it took me a while to figure it out. And I did a lot of journaling. Um, I had some some sort of down hard times. And, and then, of course, the film tour came out. And that was, I didn't get to ride my bike very much. And then I got really bummed about not exercising. And so I did go through kind of a wave. Um, and during that period, I did, I I started journaling and I had never journaled before, but it was a requirement. Nicholas Schrunk, the creative director, he made QN and I keep journals during the ride every day. Like he made us write voice and written journals. Um, yeah. And I carried that through and I'm really thankful I had that tool because it helped me through the sort of post, you know, you know, when you do something big, you always come back and are like, gosh, what now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, depressed or confused. And I absolutely was for a couple of years and I really had to journal and I, I basically I wrote out what I call my navigational handrails and they're kind of like my rules for life um, and the way I developed those is I looked back like okay all the good things that happened or the times where I felt in flow or doing great what were the what was happening at that time and so I kind of looked for the common themes and was like okay well I need to follow those themes in order to move forward. And so I kind of wrote down some, some guidelines for myself. Um, you know, ultimately the words be good. I, if I'm really lost, I just go back to that. And like, because we don't, we don't have a trail map. And, you know, I talk about this in one of my speeches is like all these companies develop mission statements and value statements, but we don't do that as humans for ourselves. Like, what do you stand for? Why do you make the choices that you're making? And, this took a while. It took me two years to like write these things down, you know, and I've just recently added, you know, and we've got, I've got five little things, but it's an exercise that I think is really important for us to go through. And especially as we grow and learn and age, we try to start to fit, like ask ourselves, what's it all about? You know, what are we mm -hmm. doing here? Yeah. Um, and so I was able to kind of develop those for myself because I need, because I was pretty lost and I needed I call them navigational handrails because I was lost. And that's what makes sense to me as a map and a compass. It's the reason all my logos, the Be Good logo has a map and a compass. It's like finding our way. Um, and we all get lost in the middle, but at least if you have that North Star, or you have a couple things that are like, what's really important to you, you can kind of stay on track. What, um, Do you mind sharing I was going to say, can chats? you share well, at least one or two of your, or all of them of your navigational handrails? Because I love that phrase. Yes. I do use North Star. I think about North Star goals a lot, but I would love, we would love to hear one, two, or all of them. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I'll share with you. And for those of people who haven't used a paper map, um, what a navigational <laughs> handrail is, it's something like a stream or a mountain or something that's pretty obvious that you can kind of keep on your sides, you might bump around in the middle in between micro navigating, but you've got your handrails that are just kind of like, okay, you know, it doesn't mean you have it all figured out, but you've got something to sort of hang on to on, on the sides. Um, so yeah. And, and again, this just came from me looking at patterns. And so, um, the first one is risk equals reward, passion equals payoff, give equals get less equals more. That's a really hard one for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> and the last one that I just recently added is that is movement equals medicine. Oh, yeah. So, and I try to hit, you know, if I'm, if I'm faced with a hard decision, I look at those five things and I'm like, okay, what aspects does it have? You know, if it only has one of them, maybe it's not okay. But mm -hmm. if it hits a few of them, if it hits all of them, you know, then, then that's a good project for me to head into. So when I am feeling lost, I, I look back at that list and I evaluate the decision that I'm trying to make. And, you know, I'm in that right now. We never figure it out. I'm in that right now. You asked at the beginning, like, what are you up to? And I'm kind of grappling with some decisions right now too. <laughs> and I'm having to go back, but think how hard it is if we don't have a map and a compass, like, what mm -hmm. are we doing? You know, mm -hmm. 
I really like those two because they're very simple and easy to remember and something you can always think about, you know? Um, a lot of people want these huge mission statements of their lives and this is my purpose of life and I've always had a hard time with that, but what you just said just resonates so much and I want to write them down because <laughs> um, it really is valuable to have some simple keywords and keywords that kind of help guide you every day. And you may not know what you're doing in the next hour or two days or, or what have you, but if you have those cues, I mean, that's that's great. I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah, well, I was going to ask when when your next book is coming out because that kind of just sounds <laughs> the like how-to book. That's the framework for your next book. I will be the first person to read it. We'll have you back oh. on. Um, <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I mean, I mean, do you? So we Angela and I talk a lot about like mantras and what get us through races. Angela's is always be strong, and mm-hmm. I write on my arm, um, race happy, race strong. Um, you know, and so, you know, and sometimes of course, mantras come to us within a race, like you don't know where they come from. Um, but do you have like specific phrases that come to you over and over again, like when you're racing or things that you, you know, hold on to as you're racing? Yeah. I mean, it, I, I, my high school cross country coach introduced me to mantras, you know, a long time ago and it was pretty cool. Um, and you know, I had, I had had a really bad regionals. We were heading to the state meet and I quit the only race I've quit in my life. I stepped off the course cause I wasn't doing well. And I sat with him and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I let my team down all this kind of stuff. And he, I don't know what to do for state. And he's like, I'm going to give you a mantra. I'm like, what's that? And he basically just said, all I want you to do when you're running is say to yourself, I can, I will, I won't be denied. And he's like, just say it over and over again. Cause you're, head only has room for one thing. And I ran the state meet and I just said, I can, I will, I won't be denied and finished all state. Our team won the state meet. And that was my first, I had no idea, but I'm like, wow, that brain stuff really works. Um, (laughs) and so that was my first ever mantra. And now my one that's really standard for me is be good from my dad. And Mm -hmm. it takes a lot of forms. If I'm having a bad race or something, or I'm lost in Alaska and think be good. And that may be figure this out, figure the map out, get yourself to safety, or it might be, be good to, you know, be good to yourself, be good to some, a teammate, be good to someone around you. Um, so it can take a lot of shapes, but be good is, is yeah, kind of my go-to mantra now. Thanks to dad. I love it. So, um, we're going to wrap this up, but I have one more question for you and you kind of just touched on it. So I feel bad putting you on the spot (laughs) because you don't seem to be sure what, are you excited about now? <laughs> what is next? What are you excited about right now? It's it, I'm at, thank you for asking. And what I'm excited about right now is a new foray for me. I'm about to launch, um, uh, rush Academy, which is a digital online courses. And we're starting with a gravel course. Oh, so nice. uh, yeah. Uh, first one. So I'm, you know, moving a lot of, I've I've done camps in person, but I really want to reach more people. And so I'm moving Rush Academy digital right now, and um, we'll be offering some gravel courses and that'll be launching in, um, what month is it? That'll be launching in July. So awesome. Yeah. And you heard it here first. I haven't had this out in public until (laughs) now. So I'm really excited about the educational platform, but it's new. It's all digital. It's, there's a lot, we've done a lot of filming. Um, I'm pretty excited about it, but I'm also a little bit nervous about it. I love it. (laughs) And if you, uh, if you ever make it out to the East coast and new England, (laughs) give us a shout and we will Take you for a little ride in our little community. <laughs> Just don't make me go swimming, please. Oh, no. Well, we'll, <laughs> well we have to. No, we now, have to. Now that... You like doing new things. You yeah. like doing things that scare you. So we'll just go with that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and tell everybody where they can find you. Uh, my website and my socials are all my name, Rebecca Rush, R-U-S-C-H. Okay. So you can find everything there. And uh, yeah, if you want to be first in Rush Academy, you can get signed up on the newsletter list. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. You heard it here first. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Be good. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. And we hoped you enjoyed it. You can find us at amywoodsfitness.com and angelanath.com. We'd love to hear from you.